Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences has today decided to award the 2024 Nobel Prize in Physics to John Hopfield, Princeton University, USA, and Jeffrey Hinton, University of Toronto, Canada, for foundational discoveries and inventions that enable machine learning with artificial neural networks. That was the big breaking news. Jeffrey Hinton, the winner of the Nobel Prize for Physics for 2024, for that pioneering work, that foundational work on artificial intelligence. He and his co-winner, John Hopfield from Princeton in the United States, being honored for helping lay the foundation for the technology that promises both fundamental change and portends an existential threat for humanity. And on the phone with us this morning is the Nobel Prize winner in physics, Jeffrey Hinton from Palo Alto, California. Professor, good morning. Welcome to CBC Morning Live. And first of all, congratulations. Thank you. Are you really in a cheap hotel in California, as you told the news conference, sir? Yes, I'm in a cheap hotel that doesn't have an internet that works and um, only has a poor phone connection. Oh, my goodness. So you haven't seen the Internet blow up with word of your breaking news and the and the awarding of the Nobel Prize to you, because there's a lot of interest, obviously. And here in Canada, it is tremendous. Can you tell us just the just the just the personal part to all of this in the middle of the night? What happened? Did the phone ring in your hotel room? Can you take us through the chain of events? Um, yeah, my cell phone rang. Um, and. My first reaction was, how do I tell this isn't a spoof call? Um, but the guy had a strong Swedish accent, and the call was from Sweden. Um, but I had no idea I'd been nominated for it, and I was completely flabbergasted. I never expected to get the Nobel Prize in physics. It could have been an AI scam. You never know. They're very good now. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But that is a, that's a wonderful moment. So did you, when you, when you <laughs> realized that it was for real... How did you react? My jaw dropped open. And did you whoop in excitement or did you call anyone to share the news? Have you had a moment to do that? Um, I'm here with my partner, Rosemary Gartner. Um, and yes, we both got quite excited about it. I'm sure. <laughs> so I'm just wondering too, who you might have thought of. Is there some person who was important to you along the way? Was there a moment in your academic career that came to mind as you have been awarded really the top prize in your domain? Yes, there were two people. So um, the people, my two most influential mentors, um, there was David Rummelhart, who died quite young of a nasty brain disease. And I worked with him on an algorithm called backpropagation. That's now what's used in these big chatbots. And there was Terry Sanofsky, who was actually a student of Hopfield's. And I worked a lot with Terry Sanofsky on how to take Hopfield networks and make them more general and make them able to learn representations. Um, so probably the most exciting research time I had in my life was with Terry Sanofsky working on what we call Baltimore machines, which are just a generalization of Hopfield nets. You mentioned him in the press conference after the fact, gave him an acknowledgement there as well. So those are the people who came to mind as you celebrate this incredible achievement. You know, sometimes the Nobel winner is a surprise to many, but I think your name will not be a surprise to many, given how prevalent artificial intelligence is in our society, is globally already. And I'm wondering if I could ask you about that. As you were doing your research, thinking about artificial intelligence, did you think it would become so prevalent, would permeate our world, our life, as quickly as it has? No, I thought in the end, if we could get this stuff to work, it would be very important. Um, but I thought it would take longer to have this big an effect. And do you think it will continue to advance as quickly? I mean, certainly they're spending hundreds of billions all over places like Silicon Valley and elsewhere. Do you see the pace either maintaining or even accelerating in the development? I certainly don't see it hitting a wall or slowing down. Some people say it's about to hit a wall and slow down. I think that's nonsense. Um, it's 
developing very fast and will continue to develop very fast. And perhaps the best way of understanding that is to look at what we could do with AI 10 years ago and look at the difference now. 10 years ago, if I'd told you what we can do today with AI, you wouldn't have believed me. You'd have said that's just science fiction. And I think in another 10 years, um, it's going to be as big a change again. And you've talked about that. You talked about it in the press conference after the award, but you've talked about it in interviews with my colleagues here at CBC, the promise of artificial intelligence. In, in speaking of the potential to be a, a new industrial revolution, you've talked about health care and productivity, new drugs, tools to understand and combat climate change and things of that nature. But you've also talked very clearly about your concerns for its consequences. And indeed, you mentioned that this morning as well. Um, I'm I'm wondering if we could talk about those for just a moment. Do you think, I mean, everywhere already you're so well known globally for sounding the alarm about um, AI essentially taking over control. Does the Nobel Prize, do you think, does it give you potentially a moment, a greater platform to, to raise consciousness about your concerns? Um, I think it obviously does, yes. And so what would you like that message to be today? that fairly soon, probably within the next 20 years, we're going to develop things more intelligent than us. And we've never been there before. We have no idea what it's going to be like. And we should be working hard now on how to make sure it doesn't take control away from people, because what we care about is people. Um, and so the best young researchers should be putting a lot of effort into that research problem now. We don't know if there's a solution, but if there is, we need to find it fairly quickly. And governments should be encouraging big companies to provide the resources necessary to do this safety research. So right now, um, companies like OpenAI are clearly putting profits ahead of safety. OpenAI was set up with a big concern about safety. But more recently, the safety researchers have all left, and OpenAI is much more concerned with um, pro making profits in the next few years than with the ultimate safety of this technology. You just mentioned that there isn't a solution yet, but do you, as you, are you offering advice? I mean, do you believe it will be possible to constrain? And if so, what is your best thinking in terms of how? I actually have no idea. It's not like climate change. So with climate change, we know what to do. You just stop burning carbon, and in the end, everything will be okay. It's just we don't have the political will to do that. The big oil companies don't want to stop burning carbon. Um, with this, it, there isn't such a neat solution. We don't know what to do. That's why we should have the best young researchers trying to figure that out now. I think I'm too old to figure out new ideas about what to do, but I'm... I'm not too old to recommend that governments should make the big companies provide the resources and the young researchers should work very hard to figure out if there is a way that people can stay in control. Let me ask you, this was a question from a very bright member of my morning show team, um, wondering if your past work, if I frame it this way, past work on AI is helping you now in your current research on AI, or for another way of saying this, as AI is becoming more capable and the machines are learning to do more, do they become then to you a helper for more research on how to make them even more intelligent? Yes, I mean, that's everybody, more or less everybody believes that will happen, that as AI gets smarter, AI will be used to make things even smarter. So maybe that's where the solution lies within. It would be very nice if AI could figure out how to keep AI safe. Um, but that sounds a bit like letting the police monitor the police. Indeed. Can I ask you, as I talk to you, sir, I'm thinking about your coming back to Toronto. And there are a lot of people already very excited about the Hinton Lectures at the end of this month. Um, the two-part lecture that you're going to be hosting, and it's free, incidentally. I'm thinking that the uh, attendance will, will, if not already sold out, it's going to be swelling to maximum. Um, what do you think you'll be telling people when you come back to Toronto in this series at the end of this month? pretty much the same as I've been telling you, that AI is going to develop rapidly. It's going to be wonderful. It's going to lead to wonderful health care, for example. 
You're going to be able to go to a family doctor who's seen 100 million patients, many of them just like you, and remembers everything about their genomes and their relatives' genomes. It's going to be fantastic, um, which is why progress is not going to be stopped. I don't think we can hit a pause button on AI because there's so many enormous benefits from it. But we really need to worry about how to keep it under control. Sir, it's a pleasure to speak to you. It's an honor to speak to you, particularly on this day. And again, I wish you congratulations. Enjoy this moment. And we'll look forward to those lectures and to hearing uh, in December when you're awarded your prize and your message at that time and what your message will be today. So thank you for the time today. Congratulations. Thank you.